welcome. Way the brush. Doing this tonight and um, Saturday night. Saturday night. So, uh, is there anything that is right off the hop kind of troubling you guys, or were you guys just kind of curious, like what I'm currently working on, or like is there any aspect of miniature painting that you know is causing you woe, or you know, really, is there anything, or should I just start working on what I'm currently working on, which is Abaddon? I have right here. Let's see, where is he? Get over here. He's in a whole bunch of sub assemblies. Uh, his base, obviously, I just primed it in white. I have been working uh, on this guy for a little bit. Um, I started off with um, what the hell is the paint called? It is Mission Models. It's a recent company I've gotten into. Um, it's, they're out of Salt Lake City. And uh, it's an airbrush line. Wanted to go with kind of a really dark armor for them, so I started off with a metallic. And then basically what I've been doing is, have been working with uh, painting his armor in Liquitex uh, ink. And so, let's see if we can zoom in a bit here. Zoom in, there we go. And let's focus. Where's the focus? Focus, there we go, All right? So, oh yeah, that's great. There we go. Can you guys all see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, you guys can scooch in closer if you like. I mean, you know. But, uh, yeah, so, again, I started off with a, a black metal. He looks really, really shiny at the moment. Um, but, you know, like I said, it was, it was a metallic. I Basically, what it is is I started him in sub-assemblies. His uh, front and back half, if you're familiar with this kit, is that you can take these armor bits off and you can see like his under details. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that or are a lot of you guys like into like Games Workshop models or is it like just like anything in particular, like, you know. But yeah, so um, I left all those, basically all these bits here you can take off because uh, I wanted to get into, you can see kind of in behind his head, like it's a uh, not terribly great here, but let's see here. Let's take this back armor off. So I didn't glue this yet. Yeah. And so just so I can get into there and highlight that space inside there. But you can see how like he's still very, very shiny. But like uh, on the top here, I hit it with black ink just to kind of knock the metallic down because basically I want it to be kind of, you know, he's grandiose, right? He's the war master. And so I wanted something fairly interesting. Uh, the gold I did on this, I initially was going to go with um, Vallejo's liquid gold uh, for the armor. I actually did it on a bit of this side of his armor here on his leg, and I didn't like it. And so I actually went with uh, this other paint. Well, it's not a paint, it's, it's an ink. Uh, Liquitex uh, Iridescent Bright Gold is what I've been using for this, for his armor. So I'm using just inks right now to paint this guy up and his hair fell off because I didn't glue it so but yeah like I said like um, it's just a bunch of various techniques I'm doing uh, his head you know only spent like an hour on it uh, just doing various tones started off with uh, Ricarth flesh turned um, what the hell is it called Bugman's glow turned that into a shade wash, applied it to his skin, just to kind of fall into the recess and everything like that, and then came back in with a glaze of Ricard flesh and mixed it with uh, Pallid Witch flesh and then blunt and glazed that as well. Just a couple layers, just to kind of build it up and, you know, just kind of get some varying tone on there. And then took uh, Screamer Pink and uh, Emperor's Children into the eye just to create a bit of a glow there and for his eye sockets. And yeah. But again, he, like this guy's all work in progress. Um, you know, again, with the gold here, that is this uh, iridescent ink. And the shadows uh, I used. What the hell did I use? What's that? Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, what I did was I primed the entire model and all the bits in 
um, Stino Res Gloss Black. And so that was applied over a whole bunch of his bits. I have, still have not done his, uh, his cloak. His cloak is still just bare plastic. But I have like his uh, back piece here and his claw. His claw was given um, metallic. And that's just that pure uh, color. It's called <coughs> Cold Rolled Steel, I believe, from Mission Models. And that's over the gloss uh, primer. If you guys are familiar with uh, Stano Res's gloss black. Perfect stuff for priming for metallic finishes. It's fantastic. And then with this paint that I use, this cold rolled steel, it's such a dark steel, but yet in the light it shines back, you know, a whole bunch of uh, light and everything. It's really fantastic. I enjoy it. So yeah, so anyway, in the entire piece was given that. And then of course I uh, base coated his flesh in Ricard flesh. And then again, like I said, I turned uh, Bugman Glow into a shade wash did that and then slowly built up a few highlights on it and then you know pretty much that was it like I said I only spent maybe about an hour on the head um, just kind of quickly the gold unfortunately with this gold you do have to apply it in a few layers so uh, I'm trying to remember what the hell I did for the shadows I think I took well, I took a little bit of Gianna gold thinned it down and I did uh, bit it basically kind of like a recess shade in some of the areas, just put it in between like some of the uh, fangs and the teeth and such like that. And then uh, pushed a bit of uh, raw umber, uh, which is from gold and it's their high flow line, which is like uh, this paint line, uh, gold and high flow. And they have a transparent raw umber, which is sits on top of these metallics. And it, it does a really great job without um, killing the shade because if you ever use metallics and put like say uh you know like egg racks or shade on top of it and you notice it goes completely matte right and it complete it kills the metallic shine if i'm using metallics i always want to have a nice metallic shine right and so um again with these you know it's really really fun again you could see like the armor and such like that like the uh the armor i was doing a bit of uh highlighting where you can kind of see there's like this modeled appearance on the upper portions of some of the areas of the armor, like on his leg here. Uh, let's see here, if I can get it in focus. You can see there's some high points in there because basically what I was doing was with the metal and then I was taking the black ink and I was pushing the black ink up to the high points, kind of like a non-metallic metal look so that it was, you know, obviously when you see non-metallic metal, right, it's darker at the top, gets brighter at the bottom, but then all the edges are bright. So I was kind of doing that with this, but doing it with metals. And so with the black ink, I was pushing it up towards the top, but then I take a little bit of uh, white ink, oh, the white ink's way over there, um, add a little bit to the black, make it a nice dark gray. And then I was basically just modeling the, the top and you can kind of see it like on his chest plate here. You can kind of see this slight texturing along the top. And that was there, that's just there just to give it that um, almost like hammered metal kind of look. And so it, it looks kind of like a beat metal, but still has this shiny metal property. Why do you use inks? I have uh, never used inks myself. I've seen it like for a couple people, but like none of your videos in the old days have ever used inks or anything like that. So Lately, I've been doing a lot of inks uh, just because... Um, they're like pretty thin? Yeah, yeah, like they're really, really thin. Like, okay, for example here, I'll show you really quick. Like with this, gold and I'll compare it to uh, let's compare it to GW's metallic and here I'll grab what is it paint that's not coming out let's grab let's compare it to a rule of armor gold right and we grab a brush So yeah, so um, with inks, I've been using inks for quite a while, but not a lot of videos that i produced in the past. Have I talked about a lot of stuff? Um, it's just because again, it's, it's kind of situational as far as like um, when I was doing the quick tips. You know, if nobody kind of asked me as far as a particular thing, and a lot of the quick tips, for example, like painting black, right? I get a hundred different ways uh, people ask me how to paint black. And so in the videos, I always try and show 
you know, various different ways because obviously it's not just one way to always get to the same result, right? As with everything with painting. And of course, this is kind of thick. Yeah, this is really, really thick. I kind of figured the travel here would have shook this up a little bit more. But you can kind of see like, um, where am we here? I gotta focus again. There we go. You can see how the paint yeah, is like really quite thick on the palette. And I've overloaded this brush, by the way. Normally you don't want to do that. Oh, I don't have my paint rag. Oh, I'm using my pants. So yeah, you can see how the paint is really quite thick where, when you're using normal Citadel. Um, normally, whenever I'm thinning with Citadel, uh, just the dampness of the brush, just to thin it out, and you can kind of get it to draw out like this, right? Now this covers very, very well, despite everybody kind of poo-pooing on Citadel colors these days. But with this Liquitex ink, with one drop, I did almost his entire body of one drop of this ink. Which, so a lot of the, like a little bit of this ink goes really, really far, but you do have to apply it in many layers, but it does give you this really nice lustrous finish. And the benefit of working with this ink is, um, or with, any, with almost any inks really, is that it's a thinner body, so it's not gonna dry very heavily. And because like most Citadel paints are a heavy body paint, uh, if you apply too heavy a layer, you end up leaving a lot of brush strokes. Whereas with an ink, even if you kind of were kind of haphazard in how you applied it to a surface, it doesn't really leave uh, brush strokes other than the apparent brush strokes uh, where the paint is really at its thinnest and you can see the under material showing through, right? So with these, you can kind of see here how... What's that? Can we move the TV a little bit? Do you, is, can everybody see it? Or? No, because they got to keep going this way. Oh, here. are they? Okay. Um, can we... Let's... Can we move the TV? Just move it like out more. Maybe, maybe out, out this way? Yeah. everything you're doing down here is big block. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's my fault. These guys just need to speak up and say, hey, Chris, you're screwing up here. And this is bugging me, so. Is that better? Is that better for you guys? Or more this way? No? Oh, that's good. Yeah? Okay. So with the ink, again, as I mentioned, you can see how, like, it's really, really thin. You can see how the pigment is moving around as I'm disturbing it. Kind of like, you know, when you really over-thin metallics with, with water, and you'll see, like, a separation. Whereas with this stuff, you're already at that consistency without that uh, pigment and medium separation, right? <coughs> and so when you apply this to a surface, uh, let's grab something here. Let's grab the claw. And oh, is it going to autofocus? No, it's not going to autofocus. Let's see here. And there we go. Okay. And so really quickly here. Without laying too much down. Let's see. So that's one layer. And I can still see some of the under material. Like, for example, I can see it along this edge here. I can kind of see it along that edge along there. So I will go back and apply more layers. But like I said, like you will have to apply a few layers. But as long as you're careful, you will get, you know, a, a nice lustrous finish like you see on the knee pad how like and bright nice and bright that is on his collar you know everywhere where you can kind of see the gold it's really really saturated and um and complete looking roughly how many layers would that take uh i'm noticing it's only about three layers uh like for example how, how quickly i'm kind of moving around here yeah it's only about three layers like i'm just kind of quickly going over and just hitting this hitting that It doesn't take as long as you would think, but it, yeah, it does take a little bit to to finish. Uh, I don't want to touch that. But with these inks, yeah, I do really enjoy them. Um, and if you're in the mood to take your time with a model, then this is a really fun way to go uh, to accomplish doing a nice uh, finish on something. And even with um, 
Yeah. Like if you're like even if you were going to um, use opaque colors and such, using the regular inks is really really fun. Um, it's a great way to achieve you know desired result. Like uh, for example, like I said with, with the black, uh, I was simply just applying the black, and of course uh, some uh, at some points I was taking uh, like the little sponge and uh, stippling it onto the surface so that I was leaving that metallic but having the black you know kind of showing through through the metal and everything like that it's kind of hard to see because everything else is really really shiny but i'm kind of going for a bit of a garish kind of look to it all and you know kind of having this somewhat you know not realistic but kind of just true metallics right it's, and with black legion i don't imagine they're sitting around painting their armor black right it's more like it's a black metal and you know things of that nature right and so that's the kind of look I'm going for with this guy is that, you know, it actually initially was looking more like uh, Iron Warriors with the, you know, if I did some yellow hazard lines or something like that, it would probably look more like Iron Warrior, right? So, uh, but yeah, so that is really kind of where I've been working on recently. Um, I'm trying to think here. I also brought, also, I, I've been talking about this one recently here, uh, playing with the Chrome. And this is a chrome metallic here, as well as at the end of his staff. And that was done with, and you can see here, like, beside even, like, um, the metallic gold, like how, like, you can see how much light is just bouncing back with, you know, the, uh, like, the shine of the, of the chrome. And that one uh, I've been talking a lot recently about is the uh, Molotov. Is the that's a wrap. Yeah, because the two that I often recommend for anybody out there is Spastics Chrome and the Molotov. Where the hell is the Molotov? You guys just have to trust me on that one. Yeah, so this one here, Molotow, if you guys are somewhat familiar with this one, this is not really a paint. This one is a uh, marker refill. So for, you know, like uh, metallic markers, this is the same kind of product. And so, but you can buy this, just this refill bottle and uh, it works great through an airbrush. You can also hand brush this on, but one of the downsides of using this is that you have to leave it for like 24 hours because it's a lacquer base and it take, for whatever reason it takes forever to cure. Because normally what you have to do is you have to lay it on kind of counterintuitively. You have to lay it on fairly heavily on a surface, but it will, like when I laid it down on, say for example, uh, his staff, you see how there's all these little details inside his staff. Um, when I initially laid the, uh, the color down, it obscured all the detail. And so you couldn't see it. But I knew that it reduces down when it dries and of course you know you could see it afterwards you can see all the details come back it's kind of scary stuff like i said it's kind of counterintuitive to how we paint our models where you know we lay like a lot of thin little layers down with this but with this particular product you have to lay it down really heavily if you want a nice good metallic shine even if you're doing it by brush or airbrush because even airbrush you have to do it really fast in a kind of a single pass because uh the overspray will disturb, you know, the, uh, the, the paint from settling. It'll get kind of murky and it just doesn't look right. Especially if you're trying to do like large surfaces. But the stuff I have used that's worked really well is this stuff, Spastix Miracrome. Now this is a lacquer based paint and I don't have an example. Oh wait, maybe I do have an example of this. Sorry, this my box of models here got crushed on the way here. Uh, yeah, these guys here. These guys were done with the, the spastics. This is, and you can see how it gives you this metallic shine. And of course, that, uh, the red on it, on the model, is uh, Tamiya Clear Red. And just kind of sprayed and just, you know, I was playing around. But yeah, that is just the pure chrome on the model. Um, 
I don't have the other example, do I? No, I don't. Uh, I had an example, basically, I, I laid this chrome down and then did like basically an oil wash. Gloss coated it, protected it, and then used the oil wash and then just wiped it away and it reveals like all, you know, little black lines but still keeps that nice metallic shine. The oil washes often don't obscure, you know, create like a matte finish on anything. But yeah, that is essentially it. And so, um, do you guys have like any uh, questions about anything in particular so far? Any? Feel free. So, you mentioned a couple of different ranges of paints. Yeah. What influences your decision on which paints to use? Is it just based on the shade that you're looking for, or are you looking for different qualities in the paints? Oftentimes, uh, when I'm venturing into different paint lines, it is a bit of an experimentation. Um, just the nature of my job kind of offers me the opportunity to venture into a lot of different paint lines a lot of times. Like some, a lot of painters will swear by Vallejo or they'll swear by Scale 75 or, you know, Games Workshop or what have you, right? Everybody's kind of has their favorite medium. Myself, because I've been helping people for so long, it just has enabled me to play with a lot of different ranges so that I have experience in a lot of different ranges. But as far as my own particular preferences, yeah, it has been, there's been a few factors. Like for example, I've been using these golden high flow colors uh, for quite a few years now, uh, especially for airbrush and just regular brush work. Uh, with these particular paints, I just, I just love the control. Um, they're, they're very, very thin body and the pigment is just is so striking and strong, very saturated. And it just seems like you know, in a single passes that I'm, I'm covering a surface, like for example, this titanium white, it seems like a single pass, it'll cover on top of a black very, very well, you know. And it's a very, it's uh, formulated for airbrush. Uh, I don't know if you guys are ever, uh, if you guys are familiar with golden paints, they make like artist acrylics and stuff like that. This line is designed for obviously airbrush, brushwork, pens, and you know, all sorts of stuff like that. But yeah, um, but as far as, um, you know, like really kind of going to favorites, it, it is really all about control and how much, um, how, how thick or thin I have to lay paint down. So if I feel like I have to lay a lot of layers of paint down, a lot of times I don't feel like it's really necessary. But for example, like with these inks, I've been really liking them because I kind of figured that they'd be kind of thin, but the finish I'm getting with them is really, really nice, you know, and I'm really enjoying it. Uh, um, Vallejo Liquid Gold is uh, more of an alcohol base, a, a base acrylic. And that one, I just wasn't, in, like, I've seen a lot of great results with it, but I gave it a try on a model and it seemed like in a single pass, it just wasn't happening. And I was just, I was really disappointed. And so that's where I started venturing out to this. Again, that's kind of where, why I'm venturing off into different brands, right? I'll, I'll, I'll have a vision in mind for a particular thing for a model and I'll try a product or I'll try, you know, like Games Workshop colors and I'm not getting that same finish that I want, that I'm looking for, right? And a lot of times with metallics, I want the pigment to be very, very tight and give me almost uh, chrome-like looks, right? Because like you can kind of see like on this bottle here, you can see how, like, you can see the, the reflection of the ceiling here, um, like that. And that is how the paint looks. It's, it's a very chrome-like finish. And this one here is really great. I, I highly recommend this one for model painters uh, who want that high metallic finish. Uh, just because this one through the airbrush, this is the best way to apply is by airbrush. Uh, with this one, because you can build it up in layers. And so it's kind of like how we're used to building up paint on models. So kind of just doing a couple little quick little passes and, you know, laying it down. And it builds up to a nice finish versus the Molotov where you have to lay it basically in one shot heavily and, you know, kind of pray that it, it works, right? So it's good. It, this is the best one for a chrome look. But, yeah, the spastics is much easier to use. But, yeah. Super novice painter right here. Yeah, sure. Why is it that you do multiple layers? Multiple layers of color? Uh, is, yeah, like, normally back in my, my early days, I went, boop, slapped on one layer, and then 
you know, that you know, I, I sometimes have hit, I saw streaks that I put more than one layer, but like that was never really a mental thought process when I was approaching the painting. Yeah, the no. So it, it seems like that's very much a like, like you, you know, process. Yeah, you'll you'll see a lot of artists. They often recommend applying a lot of thin little layers down, right? Now the reason why so many people, and I, I highly recommend it as well, uh, and you'll find this out as you, you get further along and kind of really, kind of really getting into your model painting, um, basically is you want to control how thick the paint is. Uh, when you're applying it in, say, one goop and you're just applying it down onto the model surface, what ends up happening is you can kind of see how like the paint is kind of dried here, and you can see how like there's a surface to it, the Citadel stuff. You can see how there's high points and low points, kind of like how the light's playing on it. Yeah. So what that does on your model surface, on a very small microscopic layer, is have you ever dry brushed a model and seen that it was really, really chalky? And like, Jesus, it's like really, really chalky. It's because the dry brushing picks up that, those hot peaks and valleys on the model surface. So a dry brushing that looks really, really chalky, it's because there's a lot of, lot of hot, uh, hills and valleys on that surface, right? So if you can lay down a nice smooth base coat on that surface and you dry brush, it ends up almost looking like airbrushing if you can lay a nice smooth base coat down. Now if you can apply it by spray, by airbrush, or if you know how to do it by a brush, and applying a nice smooth base coat by brush, which is, the, I, uh, in my opinion, the key to excellent painting, especially when early on for if you consider yourself a novice, is that you develop good habits early on. And then, of course, once you really start to master applying a nice smooth base coat, everything else starts to fall into place. Everything else like glazing and edge highlighting, layering, and of course mixing your colors and knowing how to thin your colors and all that, that all falls into place once you start to really take uh, laying a nice smooth base coat down seriously. And so basically what you want to do when you're laying uh, a base coat down is most of the time, most people will thin with water but I would often recommend you use a medium. So if you're using Citadel colors, I definitely would recommend using a uh, Lamy medium. Now, Lamy medium is kind of expensive in regards to, you know, the whole range of Citadel products. I often will use um, something like, for example, you can get Tester's Aztec acrylic thinner, universal acrylic thinner. And you can find this in most hobby places. And this works just great. And it's, and it's thin like water, you can kind of see. And this will thin out. Citadel color is just fine. It's not going to explode on you or anything like that. And of course, that, that paint's completely dry. But yeah, um, for example, there, a little, little dollop of paint, right? And then when you thin it in, and it, what now basically the importance of this, of thinning with medium, is that when you over thin with water, and especially when you are relatively new to painting, the tendency you end up having to do is, or you end up doing, is over thinning with water, and that breaks the surface tension of the paint. So if you ever painted on a surface and you've used a lot of water, like for example, let's, let's grab a little bit more paint. Actually, metallic's not a really great example here. Let me grab an opaque color. Grab, I don't know what is this. Temple Guard Blue. And you really over thin an acrylic paint with water you break down that surface tension. And so what ends up happening is the paint, right, will begin to um, bubble up, right? And and it just doesn't sit on the surface. I'm, I'm trying, what the heck's that word I'm looking for? You know when paint kind of bubbles up on the surface, like you get the water? Oh, yeah, you guys know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean, I don't know what's it. Yeah, I can't, I can't think of what the term's called. That bubbling term. But yeah, <laughs> like you can see how like the paint, um, isn't gathering properly, and I, 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 this is probably not the best example on this palette here of really kind of breaking paint down, especially on a on a surface. Um, okay, yeah, here I'll show it on a space marine here. So you're laying the base coat down. Ah, oh, excuse me. Let's go ham. Boom, boom. All right, and so you have the paint in a really thinned out fashion. Now imagine there is. A, be, a primer here, and you can see how it beads up, right? You can see how that it's all beaded up. I, I just yeah. did that one brush stroke, and you can see how it all beads up. So that's because the the paint has become oversaturated with water, and so it breaks its its uh, viscosity down. 
Whereas if the paint, oh, I got a little bit right there. If the paint is left pretty much undisturbed, no, that's not too much, still too much water there. I don't have a rag for it. But if you have, if you leave just, just the paint pretty much undisturbed or you use the medium, you can see how it covers, right? You can see how it's nice and smooth. And so if I apply the medium, let's take a little bit of the medium and add that to that little drop of paint. It's probably too much medium, but. And so again, yeah. Well, with the surface tension, but it's still holding a little bit better than it normally would. But you can kind of see with the medium there how it's covering. And so when you get into glazing and stuff like that, it becomes much easier and when you're doing a base coat, to, to bring it all back to your initial question, um, when you're applying a base coat and you're, you're thinning the paint down, I highly recommend you use a medium to do it, even if you're relatively new and, the, in, and not used to this kind of concepts. <clears throat> when you alternate your brush strokes. So if you lay the, if you lay the base coat down Say for example, I was laying the paint down and I was laying the paint like this in north-south kind of direction on the model. I'd allow it to dry completely and then come in with another thin layer and do east-west direction as I worked around the model. So it, it, it kind of makes, it forces you to kind of um, be conscious of your brush strokes and conscious of what you're doing. But in the end, it'll just become second nature as you develop as a painter. You'll just, you know, you'll just always It'll just be muscle memory at that point, right? And so your brush strokes should always be alternating. So if you go in north-south, your next ones will be east-west. Then your third layer will be north-south. And if need be, possibly a fourth layer, again, would be east-west. You know what I mean? As long as you're alternating the brush strokes. Basically what that do is doing is it's creating a lattice on the surface, right? And so that, on a microscopic layer, will be a smoother surface. And that is better for glazing, for dry brushing, for layering your highlights, and just for your overall finish of your model. Just laying a nice smooth base coat. There's three fundamentals to model painting, right? Fundamentals being uh, assembly, priming, and base coat. Assembly, cleaning your models, cleaning off the little nubs, mold lines, filling gaps that kind of stuff, right? When you start taking model assembly and painting seriously, uh, then priming, right? The job of a primer is just to provide a surface for paint to grab hold of. A lot of people tend to prime in black or colors or anything like that. And that's not completely necessary because it ends up, you know, you see a little bit of the plastic showing through and you're like, ah, oh, I missed the spot. So you come back in and you lay more primer down, you end up laying too much primer down because with too much primer, it ends up creating a surface on the model kind of like paper where you lay these thinner paints down and you'll see it, you know, if you see like ink on paper where it'll just bleed out like that, that's what will end up happening. You'll see your paint going like that, bleeding out into the model surface. And so, you know, obviously that's no fun, it's no good, and, and it often makes it hard for to build up the saturation on the model. You'll see like that if you went with white and you laid too much white down and you're trying to lay like a darker color down, you'll see a lot of that white primer showing through still. That's because you've over primed and the primer is absorbing all that paint. So when it's okay to under prime, to uh, see some of that under material, that's okay because the job, the job of a primer is just to provide a surface so that when you are laying that thin paint down, that it's not running and, and, and beating up, right? It's gonna cover evenly on the model surface. Then of course, laying base coat down. And as I said, it's, you know, it's a, there's three fundamentals to good model painting and I, I've made many videos on these, on this subject in many words in his vault and, you know, so, but of course I was end up, you know, reiterating it, but it always seems like, you know, these kind of things do need to be said over and over and over again, you know, but, um, yeah, oh, that stopped, my dad stopped. Don't stop believing. Now it wants to go again. Bad little thing. Anyhow, and here's still going. Here's still going. Okay, so everything's still going. Um, yeah. So 
That answers the question? Yeah. Yeah? Can... Yeah. No problem. So feel free to keep asking questions and, you know, uh, of course that goes for everybody. Um, Ralph, you got a question? I, you look like a man who has a burning question on his brain. Honestly, anything. Anything. Anything at all. Doesn't even have to be hobby related. Actually, it is just with a different hobby, kind of. I think about getting some metallic models such as the uh, Battletech ones you got. And oh, always, stuff. I always forget that you have to technically prime the more metallic, metallic ones when I think it's a computer. Yeah, or computer. Not. If they're special primers or if you don't have to be paid correctly on it. No, pr um, the pewter models, pla resin models, and plastic models, all the same kind of primers you can okay. use, right? Um, do you have to wash pewters like you do with resins and fine cast stuff? If they're older or if you've been handling them a lot, so if you've been gaming already with your pewter models and you've been gaming and they say, oh, you know what, I'm going to finally get to play a painting. You, you, you should wash them. You should give them a wash uh, in um, like iso alcohol or um, usually iso alcohol is enough, just a cotton swab and just give it a, like the surface a good cleaning, you know, not, not heavily saturated because you don't want to, if you use super glue or anything like that, it can possibly break down that bond, make it weaker, what have you, right? So. You know, just wipe down the surface and then, of course, give it a good prime. Um, don't over prime, of course. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, you can use Krylon, you can use Citadel, you can use, you know, whatever choice primer you like. And just don't over prime it. And, you know, what's that? Good old Rust-Oleum spray. Yeah, good old Rust-Oleum. Yeah, the Rust-Oleum, you know, I mean, because it's available everywhere, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it exactly. Works. It works. And I mean, yeah, you, you know, why fix what, what, what already works? Or is that how it goes? No, I, that's not how it goes. That's not how that expression goes. Yeah. So, let me see here. Yeah, you can kind of see. Um, it's, the camera kind of shows it as, like, it's really shiny. But to the eye, like, I can still see um, black showing through on this edge here. Just to kind of go back to this point here with the gold. And so, yeah, I'd probably go over and give this, you know, two or three more layers. Uh, this is still sunny. Yeah, this is still wet. That's pretty good. So, yeah. I'm in my own light here. And even with this, even using these inks, I find that alternating my brush stroke as well helps create that, um, the lattice work for the, uh, it's a, a mica flake that's often in metallic paints. And so I often find that alternating the brush stroke. So if I want to go, you know, left, right, because if, if you can recall, I went this way with the brush stroke before, following the form. And whereas this way, I can, you know, alternate it and, you know, go for something else. And again, it basically, when you alternate the brush stroke, especially even with metallics, um, you know, you're building up that lattice and you're filling in those gaps and, you know, just getting a much stronger finish. Often with metallics, it just, I don't know, I've been not, like lately, I've just been on this metallic kick and, you know, it's been a lot of fun, but yeah. Is that the type of palette you usually use? This? No, actually, I don't. Uh, in the videos um, that you see from Mini Wargaming, uh, it is basically like a clear glass I'm working on, and that's only just because of filming. Um, it's a reusable surface, right? And I have like a little backdrop underneath it, so and you know, I always for consistency's sake. Uh, but for palettes, typically, uh, I will use like a wet palette. Uh, especially when I'm going to sit down and do some actual painting and glazings or, you know, blends or what have you. Um, but otherwise, yeah, usually just like uh, margarine containers, you know, just those disposable plastic lids. Anything, really. I mean, I'll, I'll just use this palette. Yeah, I mean, you could use anything as a palette. I mean, you know, top of this bottle, you know, or what have you, right? I'm not really... Oh, another one, yeah, that I would use is like the, these plastic bits here. I just use that, especially for when I'm playing with... Um, some of these lacquers and I just want something that I can just chuck away, you know, because Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well yeah, because the lacquers aren't gonna sit on a wet palette, right? Because lacquer and water don't mix. So yeah, you know, I, yeah, you never use that stuff with a wet palette. Wet palette's only for water based acrylics, right? Uh, you don't you need it for oils because oils take a week to dry, right? And you know, lacquers and water don't mix, right? So yeah, um, Disposable little palettes like that for funny little products like this. Uh, otherwise, yeah. I'll, if it's just for like a quick little half hour painting session or an hour painting session, I'm sitting down, just whatever free time I have. Yes, yeah, it, 
this this kind of palette is just you know if need be here's just this demonstration i only brought it here i mean like this one here like honestly it's you probably can't see it but it's got dust because <laughs> I, I haven't used it in a while i only brought it for the demonstrations here today right so yeah um but yeah usually it's just a pane of glass for the videos and i can usually just take a, a razor blade peel off the dry paint and then windex it and you know cut, clean it up so is that what the windex is for uh, the Windex was for if I was going to do any airbrushing, because I brought my airbrush, so just in case you guys had any questions about anything for airbrushing or... Does what? that take the chrome off of your airbrush, though? The Windex? Yeah. No. I have been, wind I've been using Windex. I've been only airbrushing, seriously, uh, airbrushing for about uh, six or seven years. And this airbrush here is basically my first airbrush I got from Badger. Uh, because they were kind of to send us a bunch of uh, products and they sent us the one Minotaur first came out and everything like that. Uh, benefits of you know working for a uh, high profile company, right? Um, but yeah, that's my cup. I keep it clean and I uh, I only flush with Windex uh, between colors and after a paint session. And that is it. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's it. I mean, the outside's a little bit dirty. My nozzle, you know, a little bit dirty, but otherwise, you know, my cup, I mean, you know, I don't know. Yeah, the action's all right. Uh, let's see here. My needle's probably a little bit dirty. It feels a little bit dirty. Yeah, it's a little dirty. Yeah, my needle's a little bit dirty. I didn't clean it before I came here. You can see there's still a little bit of paint residue on it. Apparently black, it was the last thing I was working with. I think that's the metallic, actually. And that was that. Uh, mission model paint I think I was talking about but yeah um, with Windex um, it's fine uh, and this brush I use all the time uh, I've used these lacquer based paints through it I've used this paint through it use this paint through it I haven't I spray the inks I might spray a few of the inks through it but otherwise yeah but I mean like I go between water based acrylics and lacquers and you know i only use the windex for the lacquer based i often will use um lacquer thinner to run them through but you usually have the respirator for that just because you know obviously you don't want to be breathing that crap in uh with water-based acrylics you should be wearing a dust mask at least you know when you're when you're airbrushing stuff just because of the particulates um you know with this molotow this is uh like a lacquer based paint so you definitely want to be you know protection and such now most of the time I don't but <laughs> but do as I say not as I do um, no with the lacquers though I don't screw around I have a big respirator that I wear with the lacquers but like the water-based stuff I, I'm not that worried about <laughs> as he says as he says from next year when he's in chemo <laughs> Yeah, coughing up a little bit of blood. Oh, look at that, my fist in red. You can run it through the air gun. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Not a great idea for blood <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, like I said, like, um, with the Windex, no. I mean, now, mind you, I mean, maybe other airbrushes out there. Maybe the cheap China ones. I know, you know, a lot of people complain about those brushes. I don't know if Wadas are like that. I've never used a Wada. Um, like I said, I've only been seriously airbrushing for about six years, and I've only ever been using Badger sound like a badger fanboy but i mean so far i mean like, like i said like that's just taking care of the brush um you know you take care of your brush take care take care of you and you know that's it you know it's it's all about care it's all about care for your tools you know especially if you want to get a lot of life of them you know the brushes the same thing right you know take care of the brush and um yeah what kind of brushes were those these this is a Artis Opus. Um, oh, the S's. Yeah. Um, when they were doing the Kickstarter early on, they sent us some of these. And so I've been playing with them for a while. I like them. Uh, this is the number two. I, I use this um, for you know general kind of stuff. But I found that I only ever really use the one. Uh, yeah, I've never, I haven't busted out. Here, I'll, I'll pull them all out. I have a whole bunch here. 
Um, like I have, I think I've used the triple zero. Where the hell's the camera? I've used the triple zero, but you can kind of see. Oh, here, let's pull the caps off, just so you guys can see that I'm not even using these things. And I've been using these brushes since before they kickstarted. And yeah, they're pretty pristine, right? You think, oh yeah, Chris really takes care of his brushes, but I I hardly ever use these brushes, honestly. So that's the secret, just barely use the brush. Just barely use it. Well, because, I mean, honestly, like, the like because these are intended for, like, you know, your detail, your eyeballs, scroll, script work, or, you know, things like that. I use the one. This one, now it might not seem like it, but this one here, yeah, this is the one, comes to a really fantastic point. I'm doing, I've been, I did all of Abaddon's face with this one. That was his eyeballs, doing his glazing, all that. And that's all I used was this brush. Now I'm not saying this is the best brush in the world, but it's, Guess the job done. it's getting the job done and pretty well. Now, have you used it to actually try and do like a freehand writing on it, like the like little script and stuff? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what the hell I was using this for, but I did tiny little things. Like I said, like I his face. That was all with the same brush, doing his eyeballs and his eyes. I don't know if it shows through on the camera here. His eyes have a tiny dot, dot of white in the center. If you look at the model itself, you can probably see it. Or maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. Or maybe I'm fooling myself. But, yeah. Like, like I said, that's, that's, that's all I was using was the one. Um, but same thing with my, my Windsor Newtons. I have my Windsor Newtons Series 7. And this poor girl has, uh, hasn't been used in a while. This is my Zero. And this, again, this was, I used the Zero most. And I have the Triple Zero and the Double Zero. I, I don't even think I've taken them out of their packages. This Zero would just did the job. It just did the eyeballs and just did all the work. You know? I have like these older, this, this action brush has been getting a lot of use lately too. This is an older uh, heavy metal brush. And, you know, it's pretty big even compared to like the one. You can kind of see how it's a lot bigger of a round. But even with this brown handled brush, this old heavy, heavy metal brush, it does really fantastic work and details. I'm not dotting eyes with it or anything like that, but it's definitely getting the job done. Yeah. But of course, uh, I mean, like you can see, like I use this brush. But again, uh, actually, you can see quite a bit of gold actually still on the brush. You can see some gold flake. That's actually what I was using to do the gold of him. Um, but again, you can see, like, like I said, uh, with this one here, you see it looks pretty good. It's a little bit of discoloration up by the furrow. That's unavoidable, really. But as long as you take care of the brush. And like I said, uh, when did this Kickstarter come out? A year ago? Two, almost two years ago? I think the number was yeah, it was it was a while ago. They, they this because like I said, this was their pr their prototype first run that they did that they uh, gave uh, made available for us, and uh, yeah, this brush has gotten heavy use in that time. But like I said, you just take care of your brush, and it, you know that point is is nice and sharp, and you know, and it's all about brush care. You know, just take care of your tools, and they're gonna be there when you need them, especially if you're dropping, what does that brush set cost? Like a hundred and some bucks for the whole set? Something like that? I think it's 70 for three of them. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty pricey. And uh, Games and Gears, they were showing me their uh, their new little set and it has like seven hairs in the, on the bristles. But, yeah, it, but it's it looks pretty. What would you use that for? I don't know. If you want to write like microscopic print. Yeah, yeah, I guess, I mean. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe he was up. Like maybe he was really being great salesman. But yeah, I was like, oh, you know what? I think I need that. <laughs> yeah, seven hairs on a brush. I, I, I might need that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's kind of I'm not getting that compromise. But like, what do you do for brush care? Because I have like a horrible habit of destroying brushes. Okay. It's like I try, but it's like, like why do I keep destroying these brushes? Okay. Yeah. Excellent question. Yeah. No, uh, and I mean, like I said, like it's such feel a simple. It seems like such a simple concept that in practice nice. does not seem to be that simple. I have an add-on to this entry. I've heard there was a trick through the Gary bottle, uh, rubber band, and some Dawn soap. 
by just leaving the hairs in overnight, but not up to where it connects the metal. Okay, well, it's using the Dawn soap and, and that method uh, and leaving the brush inside, that's if the brush, do I have any extra brushes here? I don't think I do. I think I only brought good shit with me. <laughs> yeah, none, none of that, none of that lower, you know, no, for the plebs. Or that raffle. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, that method sounds more like a brush restoration. So the hairs of the brush have gone everywhere. Now, mm -hmm. the reason you get that the hairs displaying everywhere is because uh, material is drying in that space in the, in the furl, right? And so that, as you can imagine, as that paint is building up and it's getting in between the hairs, the hairs are all starting to splay outwards, right? So how do you fix it? Well, there's our, there are products out there. Vallejo makes one called a brush restorer. And basically it's the same kind of process of leaving the brush, just the furl and bristles, just like that. Don't go all the way in because you definitely don't want to be uh, corroding the glue that's holding this part to the handle. So you only ever want that portion submerged. And basically what it's doing is it's gently breaking down that, um, the acrylic that's in there. And typically it's acrylic. Hopefully it's not lacquer because if you're using lacquers with your sables, you're going to shorten a life because with lacquers, you often have to use lacquer thinner, which is a very harsh chemical solvent and it'll destroy the uh, sable hairs, right? And the sable hairs are really expensive and especially with a lot of these nicer brushes, it's a sable, right? There are other blends, but, but anyway, um, for cleaning, basic, my basic process, process for cleaning is often with this stuff. Master's brush soap. There are other brush soaps out there. And even like the guys who do, uh, artist opus who do these brushes, they sell a, a soap along with it. I like this stuff. This stuff, you go to Hobby Lobby or any other art supply place, it's like 10 bucks for a little tub of this. Less than that. It's not much. And it, basically it's a, it's a, just a, a, a dry soap. You know, it's, Obviously, it's cake because of excess moisture and, you know, the soap, you know, just retracts from the container. But it's not going to affect the soap. And you can see the soap is pretty dirty, as most good soap will be, right? You look at the soap in a garage or what have you, and it's usually cake and oil and grease and what have you. But anyway, with this, uh, I, now, mind you, that with this stuff, this is my favorite way of cleaning brushes. But, for example, after a paint session, the brush is all dirty with paint and what have you. Now, we're not going to see a lot of paint transfer. Oh, let's grab some. Screw. Am I? Okay. I'm going to grab a little bit of paint here. Yeah, there we go. So we'll get some paint on the brush now. All right. And so the brush is nice and dirty, right? So we rinse it off. And hopefully there'll still be some paint on it. And there kind of is, but not really. So with it, run through the soap. Just back and forth gently. You don't want to feel the furl touching the soap. You only want the bristles making contact. So it's more like this kind of action, right? If you're pushing all the way down, you're gonna crimp those hairs at that furrow and which will force splaying of the hairs. So you always wanna be somewhat gentle with the hairs, right? And so you're just going like that. And of course I didn't get enough water on there. So you wanna work up a nice lather on the soap and you can see there's a nice little lather developing there. And oftentimes what I'll do is I'll do it in my hand like so, and I'll just run the brush again and just massaging it into the hairs. Again, trying not to get into the furl? Or right, yeah, if you feel the furl into your hand, you're, you're, you're applying too much pressure because it's all about subtlety, right? That's the best way of preserving your bristles, especially if you spend a lot of money on your, on your brushes and you want to preserve them. And sable hair brushes are expensive. Go to any art supply place and pick up watercolor brushes and, you know, you know, like the good sables, and they're really expensive. You can get up to $100 for some brushes. Yeah, just for a brush. Yeah, it's crazy, but... So you just run it through the soap. Uh, in your hand, it's fine. It's not toxic or anything like that. Rinse your brush off. Now, if you're going between colors or anything like that, you can just do that and then start working with the next color. It's not necessary because uh, oftentimes, you know, if you're doing it between colors, you're trying to remove any excess paint that might be in there and you don't want to cause any color transferences. But they, that's when you're getting kind of really nitpicky about your painting. For the mo if you're doing like a whole bunch of models, 
not a huge concern. Just continue painting. And usually this is kind of step that you're gonna stave to the end of your painting session, right? So after I washed it, rinsed it off, I will grab a little bit of water again, and then I will run it through the soap just once or twice, just so that there's a slight coating of soap on the bristles. And then I will run my fingers through and draw the bristles out to a point. I usually don't, I try and avoid the habit of running my bristles in my mouth, but I, I'm still guilty of it. But I often don't recommend people do it just because it's just kind of a bad habit, especially with brand new brushes, because say for example, you go to a store and you pick up a brush and you're looking at the point and then you put it in your mouth and do that. Well, just think about how many other people did that before you did it, right? Yeah. Can you hold the brush too in your hand or not? Uh, not really. I mean, I'm turning it as well. So yeah, but I'm not turning it in, like, in the motion of drawing it. I'm, it's a single motion once through, but then I'll turn it and then draw it through again. And so I'm just drawing it to a point in my fingers like this. But I'm only turning it outside of my fingers. Does that make sense? So yeah, and then once that's done, then I just leave it on my table, on its side, allow it to dry. Don't let it dry sitting oh, pointing upwards. Reason being, moisture, gravity will draw down and rot the glue that's uh, holding your furl to your hand. In theory, over the course of many years of doing this, right? It's not gonna be like the first time you do it, your brush is ruined, right? I mean, you'll, you'll survive the first time this happens. But developing the habits early on will ensure that your tools are there in the future, right? So again, like I said, leave it outside to dry when you're done your paint session, hour or two, you know, and then put the cap back on, put it in your storage cup, and it's sitting there waiting for you next time you want to paint, right? Um, there was another part to that. But yeah, that's basic brush care and between paint sessions. Now, the one thing I do do, do do, um, is I will wash dry brushing brushes uh screw off notifications oh you pissing son of a yeah that's great piss off sorry it's, it's hey it's still recording beauty at least i think it is yeah it is okay so with dry brushing I will wash the brush in the soap between colors, especially because um, when you are typically when you're dry brushing, you're starting off with darker colors and you're building up to brighter colors. So what ends up happening is you end up beating the paint because of the process of dry brushing, you end up beating paint into those bristles and you will get color transfer. So for example, if you were working reds and then you were switching to a yellow to dry brush, right? which is a fairly common thing to do, you will get a bit of that red transferring into the yellow, sometimes. So often what I'll do is I'll wash with brush soap between dry brushing, just to remove that excess color. And so you can see like the hairs of my brush here are pretty neutral, but I mean, again, with dry brushing, you're gonna kill that brush and you know, it's a sacrificial lamb, it's a dirty process. There's not much you can do about dry brushing and killing your brushes, so don't ever, you know, you're not going to use these good fine brushes to do dry brushing, right? You're only going to you're going to pick a beater and, you know, it's like a rental. <laughs> there is a dirtier joke there, but I'm not going to say because my wife's in the room. Oh, she's not listening. She's not listening. <laughs> Thank God. She's never listening to me anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and that and that's again that's basic brush care, but there are preventative things you can do to preserve your brush. For example, um, of course I don't bring my sacrificial lamb with me. Yeah, just shoot. Where's, where's this one? That's the one, that's not it. Washing TV. That's okay, okay. I often have, like here's the Games of Gears ones. I kind of like these ones, these aren't bad. I've been playing with these ones as well. And you know, they, they come apart. I like that feature. You don't have to worry about have, keeping your caps all the time because these things just end up disappearing on you. With these, it's not bad at all. I just ping, you know, and away I go. And the hairs are nice. And 
you know, I mean, these ones here have gotten a lot of work. Now, there is that little thing you can see at the end of the hairs that's starting to curl. Kind of see a bit of a curl. There is a way you can fix that too. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but preserving your brushes in the long run, for example, when you're drawing paint out of the paint pots, this is usually about paint pots. If you have dropper style, you don't have to worry about this. But with paint pots, having a brush to draw out of the lip, and that's always where you draw paint from, with a paint pot, is out of this little lip. So always make give, shake your paint really well. The paint will gather on that lip, and then you can draw the paint off of it. Don't ever dunk the brush into the paint pot. Why? Because that, right? What am I doing? What's happening in that process? The paint's coming up into the furrow. Right? So, that's a big one. Okay? Now, mind you, if you have a, a sacrificial lamb brush, you know, a, a synthetic brush, or, you know, just kind of a cheapy kind of brush, no problem. Right? No biggie. It's a sacrificial lamb. It's a cheap dollar store brush, right? What have you. But you definitely don't want to be doing that with your good brushes that you spent actual money on. And, oh, well, you can see, guys, look at that. You can see how the paint is already all gathered up in there, too. Oof, that's nasty. So, yeah, that's one big one. The other one, of course, is when you're drawing from the lip and you're using your sacrificial lamb. And wherever the paint kind of gathers on this brush, you can see, like, I've only really gathered the paint about halfway, three quarters of the way up the bristles. Again, ensuring that I'm not allowing a lot of the paint to gather up into that area where the hairs are going to display because maybe this brush has got another task for me later on, right, or whatever, is I use that brush to transfer to the palette and then I'll use my good brush. Again, see, I'm guilty of putting my brush in my mouth. And I will draw, here, let's see if I can get this focused. I will draw the brush through the paint, only allowing it to gather halfway up the bristles. And that's it. That's as much paint as you really want on your bristles as you're working. And that's it. Even base coating, what have you. If you have the paint in a thinned out consistency, that's it. Because any more paint, obviously, right? Especially if you're working in a somewhat thinned out consistency. Right? So we'll have it really thin. Right? And we don't ever want that much paint. Because that's going to gather up into the furrow. That's going to shorten the, life, the lifespan of the brush. Over time. Not the first time. You do it once. No biggie. Right? But do it 500 times in the span of the brush's life. It's going to be all over the place. And you're going to end up either... Ah, oh, these freaking brushes. You know, they're supposed to be really great. And, then, you know... The hairs went everywhere on me the first time I, I opened them, you know, and it's a common thing, but again, it's, it's people not taking care of them. I don't know if any of you guys remember, uh, Citadel had that one little airbrush that looked like a hand flamer way back when people was shat, shat on that all the time. That one was a Badger 350 as a, as a hobby brush. <coughs> all you had to do was clean it and it worked fine, but because the general public didn't really know about how to take care of airbrushes at the time, everybody shit on it, right? But, you know, again, all you have to do is just take care of your tools and they're gonna work for you every time, right? Yeah, you remember that one? Yeah. So, but yeah, cool. Um, anything else I'm thinking of? I can't, I can't think of anything else right now. Um, like I said, like this, for any of you guys that are not familiar with with my work, again, especially with this format, Way the Brush, I do this uh, every Saturday. And it's a two-hour show. It's usually a lot more goofing off than this, but, you know, I do answer questions. And I answer, and I, I always encourage people to always ask questions, even if it's something that, you know, you're brand new or, you know, I, I've answered the questions a hundred times before and I'll answer them a hundred more times happily, you know, because I know that there's people that always at varying levels that are entering this hobby and you know there's always an influx of new people and there's so much information out there people are just you know flabbergasted that you know where do I go for all this stuff right and so for like really kind of really really novice people uh, there's a brand new series that we uh, that I produced for Mini Wargaming called uh, the Painting Academy 
and that one is just short videos and it's just here's what you do and no you know here's color theory here's how a brush looks and it's here dummy grab your brush grab your paint this is what we're doing and that's it well not like dummy but we that's it's a very good series <laughs> <laughs> oh right i was going to mention about taking care of the bristles so if you guys have, <laughs> if you guys have ever seen like on the end of, like can we see it yeah we can, well, you can see kind of see hairs are going all over the place on this guy too right now but you can see how like the hairs sometimes uh bend at the end on your good sable brushes and you think oh i just bought this brush and the freaking bristles are already splaying or curling at the ends right you can fix that um one way to fix it is uh conditioning the brush right so putting it in water cleaning it and then actually i could probably clean this one because i dunked it a whole bunch of times in the water here so and you can kind of see that there should be some blue paint that shows up in there and of course because i want it well you can kind of see it in the suds a bit yeah yeah a little bit it's not really i mean like to the human eye you might be able to see a little better there's a little bit of blue showing up in the soap but anyway again um so conditioning it is basically after you wash it right as i mentioned before and then um and then rinsing it off and then running it through the soap. Now the other thing you can do to fix the, the hairs curling is get a kettle or your uh, pot and um, basically just dunk the tip of the brush, not all the way to, well, not all the way on the most brushes were to, the, to this point where the glue of the furl and the handle meet because there's glue there. You wanna just dip that portion into boiling water, or, or at least really, really hot water, and then draw the point out. And what that does, that works really great with synthetics, and it also works with uh, sable hairs, and you can draw those bristles straight. And if you use it in conjunction with the soap, it'll straighten those bristles right back out. It basically is just, it's kind of like, um, like the reverse of a perm, right? Because these, these are just hairs, right? And so any kind of tricks you can think of for hair will work with these with these brushes that's why a lot of times you know like uh james was saying um you know using like dish soap and what have you right because that uh like you get like the, um, the dish soap that's really gentle on the skin that works for these hairs as well on these really good hairs sable uh synthetics and stuff like that not a huge issue because most of them are just pretty cheap and you can kind of just mm -hmm. chuck them away and you know there's not a huge concern but yeah kind of see i don't have to clean this guy better but again, this guy is kind of a, a, a work brush, and he's a beater. You need beaters. You need some really good brushes. You need some beaters. You need dry brushing brushes. You know, you end up as you develop further and further into this hobby, you end up, um, you know, acquiring many different brushes for many different roles. And you know, that's why oftentimes a lot of people do, you know, talk about uh, the quality of brushes a lot. And if you're ever looking uh, for uh, brushes, you know, outside of war gaming and stuff like that, you're in an art supply place, just watercolor brushes. That's all these are. They're just for watercolor. You, they sell them in these, like this, uh, filberts and a flat and, you know, stuff like that. And they often have these very long bristle lengths. Now, the good sable ones, they'll be expensive, you know, because sable is expensive. It's only like in Russia. It's a mink. And that's, that's the particular hair that we use for these brushes. Uh, Klonsky, that's the type of mink, or apparently, or whatever the hell it's called. But, yeah, why? We, we, uh, there's been controversy the last couple of years because apparently those animals are mistreated as they farm them or whatever. So, I don't know. Poor minks, I guess. Um, what time are we? I don't even know. I have no idea how long we've been running. 11.42. 11.42? Okay, so we got a few minutes left. Uh, any other questions? Anything else everybody else needs to know? No? I can never get OSL to work. OSL. Uh, do you have an airbrush? Yes. Okay, with OSL, um, what aspect of it that is, like, uh, troubling you? Like, uh, what is what, what in particular is... It, it never gives me the effect that I'm looking for. Like, object source lighting, it just doesn't. 
Okay, well, the thing to remember with, with, the, with a light sourcing is that, right, now this might sound really kind of technical and nerdy, but um, with light sourcing, the thing to bear in mind is that light travels in a straight line, right? So, when you're creating that light source with an airbrush, it's actually pretty easy because you can pick that direction, right, of the model. And say, for example, like I wanted to create uh, a glow off his sword, right? Here, that's, that's if we're going to put something on screen, let's make sure it's in focus, right? So, if we're going to imagine uh, his sword is glowing, and I'm going to do it by airbrush, the thing I would think about is how light emanates from the object, right? So object source lighting, this, the light source is an object, obviously. Um, often you'll see like pre-shading and zenithal. That's often referring to the light source being above the model. It's not actually on the model, right? And so it's coming kind of straight down. But that theory can work in the reverse, right? You can have, say for example, if the, the model was on a glowing floor or lava or something like that, and you could have that glow coming up. That often gets referred to as object source lighting as well, but it's, it's just all light sourcing. It's really all just light sourcing. So if I was doing this by an airbrush and I was uh, gonna have this as a glow, um, basically most things I would do, if say for example, I was gonna do this as a blue, I would start off with, um, if I was gonna go for, uh, I'm trying to think of an example here. In the, in, in the atypical fashion then, um, like a, a lightning sword or lightning weapons, and you know what I mean, like how they have that kind of tone of blue, right? Where it's it typically like a Caldor sky, which is about a mid-tone blue. In the airbrush, I would thin it down and I would probably spray it right at the direction, staring down the model like that. So that's how I'd be looking at it through the airbrush. So I would have the airbrush, right? like at that perspective, so I'm kind of spraying straight down at it, right? But I'd have the paint in a thin consistency in that mid-tone blue and slowly just build it up. Now, if there was any areas that I didn't want to have any of the color because the overspray, but the thing to remember is that the, the airbrush is acting like light in this instance that's gonna travel in a straight line, right? You don't wanna alter the position of the model as you're spraying. So if you, are spraying at this direction, light wouldn't technically hit some of these points because it technically the light is coming from the sword and it would only hit any of those faces. So even if it was hitting some of this cloth, it definitely wouldn't be hitting in some of these other sides of the folds, right? With the mid-tone blue, I would kind of create a slight aura and then I'd work it brighter and closer in. So then what you end up doing in those instances, so for example, if I'm working at say uh, 30 PSI and I've thinned the color down, you know, uh, like two to one with thinner, and I definitely would use thinner instead of water, again, just for surface tension and all those reasons, I would spray just at like a pretty broad angle like this, if I, especially if I was using this brush, and I'd spray pretty much like that and create that initial glow. Then I would take, add a little bit of white to the color, again, thin it down, Probably turn this PS, probably keep the same PSI, it all depends. It depends on what mood I'm in. And I'd come in a little closer and then kind of just slowly work closer towards here, just creating a little bit more light and shadow up by his helmet, up by the shoulder, anywhere that's getting close to the blade, right? Because anything that's close to the blade will get more light. So those points would get a little bit brighter. Uh, for masking off, say I didn't want anything on his staff, I would use something like Silly Putty or just masking tape. Painter's tape works really well, but Silly Putty has been my favorite lately. And you'll see a lot of products these days out there where it's a black putty. All that is is just Silly Putty black, but it's the same thing because it doesn't stick to the surface, but it adheres enough that it protects those areas and you can create organic shapes and stuff like that. And you know, it'll be fine. So finally then I probably, if I'd probably switch to another brush, uh, and turn the PSI probably down to anywhere from probably anywhere from 13 to 10 PSI thin the paint down a little bit more mostly white or just pure white and then Just create just a couple little high points on those areas But still trying to keep this straight kind of angle down with the airbrush So that I'm only catching just these points because if I move the brush too far or the move the model too far over and spray 
it's going to get into areas that light wouldn't get into. One of the big ones that I don't like when I see OSL on models is like Land Raiders. You ever see like, or Rhinos, and you see like the headlamps, and there's that ledge, right? And then there's a ledge that falls off, and then the rest of the tank goes forward. That ledge, often people don't block that off because light wouldn't catch on that face, right? But you see it all the time, and you see it in a lot of examples of, of paint jobs for models, and you'll see that ledge painted, and it, it just bugs the hell out of me. It's just one of those small things, you know? I just, like, it, it just takes two seconds to take that Tamiya uh, tape, to just, and it's the perfect length and uh, width to cover that spot. Spray it, pull it off, use it on your side, and you know what I mean? And you get really good OSL from the headlamps, and it just looks, you know, a little bit more realistic, right? But yeah, so with OSL, I mean, like I could, de I could demonstrate it. Uh, are you signed up for Saturday's class? No, okay. Because I, I could show it a little bit more in depth if I knew I was gonna tackle something like that. Uh, it's not that it's terribly complex, but it, usually what it is uh, is <coughs> maintaining that direction for the for the um, for the the uh, airbrush, right? It's maintaining that direction on the model. So you're constantly spraying in that direction. If you need to move the brush a little bit, sure, or the model, whichever one, right? But be very conscious of what directions you're doing. <laughs> but the big one is thinning the color down um, and turning your PSI down as you get closer, as especially if you're building up a few layers. Now, typically you can do it in probably about two or three. Uh, if you worked with the color thin enough, uh, you probably could just do it in two colors but you could do it in a few layers where you can kind of, if you thin, like say for example, you went with a mid-tone blue and you built up a little bit and you kind of built the blue up really strong close to where the sword, then you came in with a really light blue or you just simply added white to it, thinned it down, again, came in a little bit closer, but then, you know, uh, you want to turn your PSI down. About 10 is about the lowest. Usually about 30 is good enough just to go for the initial spray to kind of just hit areas and kind of work on stuff. But like I said, like if I, if there was areas on him that I did not want to hit, then I definitely would be coming in with putty and anything like that. And even just the overspray, because oftentimes, so for example, if I was working on this table and I was spraying him, the overspray from the table could come back and create a dusting on the backside. And so that can actually be a bit of a, a, a headache to deal with sometimes, you know? Not a huge issue, because you can kind of come in with uh, like some strong tape and pull that little layer paint off or, you know, what have you. Even um, if you've um, sealed between layers, you can come in with like um, uh, alcohol water. water and just pull that little layer right off and, you know, because you're just working in just thin, thin layers. Um, but otherwise, yeah, um, that's pretty much it. Do you often seal uh, your models before you do like washes and things like that? Often, yes. Uh, what do you use? To seal? Yeah. I use, I actually have the bottle with me too. Make sure I don't kill myself here. I use this, Future Floor Shine. Okay. That's all I use. That bottle, well, mind you, it's not called, it's not, it's just pledged now, but it used to be when Future used to exist. Um, now you can kind of see it has a bit of like a murky discoloration to it. That doesn't transfer over when, when you use it on a model. Uh, not in any significant, uh, you know, value change of the color or anything like that. Uh, I like glossy models. Um, you know, like I do a lot of Eldar, like my army's Eldar, and I do glossy red. So they kind of like, you know, like Ferrari red, right? Like hot rod kind of thing, <laughs> you know, again, garish. And uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I bought this, I don't know, I don't know when the hell I bought this bottle. But I mean, that's as far as I got, and I did like Titans, the Flyers, I have like a Vampire, I have a whole bunch of the Bombers and the Fighter Planes and, you know, and a whole bunch of other Wraith units and stuff like that, but everything I've, I've sealed, I use that. Because I, basically when you're sealing, you always want to seal in a gloss, and then you, if you want it matte, you can always matte it afterwards. But if you matte first and try to gloss it, it ends up looking kind of hazy. And it doesn't look quite right. And, you know, so you're always better off at least doing a gloss. Because also, too, when you gloss between, say, layers or between, like, effects or, you know, there's off, there's many reasons to gloss in between color changes and stuff like that. There's, there's many reasons for that. Um, when you do that, 
It's always better in gloss anyway. Uh, transfers, another one. You want a gloss coat before you put a transfer down. And then you can matte it afterwards and you know, not the shine off and you know what have you. But it's always better to gloss and then do a matte rather than do a matte and then try to bring it up to a gloss. You know, just if you're looking for any kind of particular effect, especially if you're working with metallics, because mattes and metallics, you just get a burnished metal look. And if you want, you know, a nice, especially if you're working in chrome, my God, man, don't ever use a matte. Just don't do it, you know. It's like, what would be the point of going with this high gloss, uh, chrome, super rich, shiny metal finish, and then throw a matte finish on it. You just, you know, you just wasted your money there. You know, so don't do it. Um, but yeah, I use this stuff. 10 bucks the store, you know, and it lasts forever. Do you run it through your... I run it through it. Yeah, I run it right through my brush. Uh, I clean it with just a little spritz of Windex. Uh, water, it's... It, I don't know if it's water soluble, <laughs> honestly, but water cleans it up just fine. Um, and, um, yeah, and then I, I flush it a couple times with water and then a final flush with uh, Windex. And with, when I'm cleaning my brush with Windex, uh, I will usually just do like uh, one or two spritzes into the cup. And then uh, I'll have the brush leaning forward and I'll just ease the uh, needle back to let the Windex fall into that space and just sit there for a moment. And I'll let, I'll let it sit there just to break down whatever's sitting in, that ne in the nozzle or what have you. And then I'll spray and then, you know, I, and then whenever I'm spraying Windex, I do spray it through the brush and just give a good flushing you know, through the airbrush. So is this sealant actually just on the fudge then, or is it something entirely different than a fudge bottle? Uh, what, what was that? It's finished. Oh, it's not, sorry, finished. It's not so. Yeah, no, no, yeah, this, the, yeah, the, the, the future floor shine, this is like, you put this on your floor to get a, a good shine, no. right? So it's, all it is is just basically an, uh, an acrylic glaze, right? If it is a purely acrylic, I could not tell you. I'm not there for the manufacturing process if it's exactly the same, but you know, it works great. Uh, it's, it's a trick I learned from scale modelers uh, many, many years ago. They, that's what they all use. Uh, the model train guys, that's what they use. And I was like, well, why the hell they do that? But it's because at the time when I was uh, learning more about applying decals very well or transfers or whatever, decals, however you want to say it, um, Transfers always sit better on a gloss surface and then you can paint it or what have you and then you can seal it in matte and it just disappears. The, the transfer will disappear. Transfers, water-based uh, water slide transfers always sit on a gloss surface better than a matte surface. So if you ever had trouble trying to get a transfer to sit on a surface, it's because the surface was uh, either like too, too, uh, too much bumpiness or it was too matte or which a matte surface basically, if you imagine the structure of the surface is like bunch of needles coming up because it's, it's breaking the refracting light. Whereas a gloss surface, right, is more like glass. It's smooth and it allows light to completely penetrate through it. And that's why color seems more vibrant through a gloss surface, right? So, whereas matte surfaces kind of dulls that appearance of how you perceive the color, right? So, uh, why, just for clarification, why, why do you uh, seal before washes? <laughs> oh, seal for before washes. Uh, because a lot of times with the washes, you know how like when you say GW's Agri or Shade or any of the other shade washes, right? It creeps into the uh, details, mm -hmm. right? The capillary action, it creeps into all the details. With this, that basically is like an assistant for that. And so basically it makes it easier. And when you apply the gloss coat, you know how like the, um, the paint was beating up on the surface? Yeah. Well, with the shade washes and the gloss coat, it'll do that even though those shade wash typically won't do that on the surface, right? You can apply the shade wash on the surface and it will tint that entire surface. Yeah. But with the gloss coat, it'll act like that uh, reduced surface tension. And so it basically, it just helps it fall into the recesses. And that's the benefit of it. Uh, a lot of people will use this uh, when doing oil washes or any other kind of washes, really. Uh, a lot of, there's a lot of times where you'll want a gloss coat uh, before, say, applying another layer. If you ever use Minotaur's ghost tints, um, they're, they're just basically clear colors. Um, you have to seal those before applying another color on top of it because for whatever reason, it seems to reactivate the color and mix. 
right on the mall, which is kind of a pain. And but I don't know if later editions of the paint they've fixed that. I don't know if it's still an issue, but it it always seems to be that the case with the uh, Minotaurs. But um, for example, you know when you're doing like the salt uh, weathering technique, if you're familiar with that, basically you'll you'll put down a layer of color where brown and orange is on a model surface, and then you'll seal it. You'll uh, apply salt onto the surface, like table salt or even kosher salt or sea salt or whatever the hell you want kind of salt, and you apply that onto the surface, and then you put a light dusting of paint onto that surface, and then use water and just kind of lightly abrade, and it dissolves the salt on that surface, and it shows that under layer through. And so all that sealant does is it stops those paints from sitting right on top of each other, because if you're gonna use an abrasive, it would pull all the layers, whereas if there's that protecting layer between the two, it only pulls that one layer. So if you ever see any really great um, weathering effects where they're like pulling that paint right off that surface and it looks like actual paint rust and you know we weathering that's what they're doing they're using that that coat between to create that barrier and to pull that layer of paint off okay yeah what yeah. washes do you use what washes do i use yeah. lately GW? Uh, i love gw washes they're great uh, I know that there is like AK uh, washes, uh, there's the Vallejo washes I know I've been recently asked about. Um, but honestly, the, what I've been doing lately is, uh, if I can find my bottle. Oh, I didn't bring the bottle actually. I just brought my little thing I use for it. Um, I use Liquitex Flow Aid, and I can turn any color I want into a shade wash. And it'll have the same properties as GW Shape Wash. And, you know, I, I, I did a video on my channel um, and showing basically just that's all you need. And it's the one thing I recommend to everybody out there to have in your uh, paint collection is Liquitex Flow Aid. Because that gives you the ability to turn any color, even metallics, into a shape wash. And you're only limited by your imagination as far as how you employ that you know laying opaque colors down and using turning metallic into a shade wash and have it fall within the recesses or using a fluorescent as a shade wash and fall within the recess anytime you want that action quickly where you want to uh, have color inside of details without actually having to take the time to actually uh, base coat it in a deeper color and then carefully pick those areas out and leaving that deeper color in those recesses right and you just want to quickly use a shade wash and pull those details forward yeah it, that, it allows you to do that, and it's super, super handy. I don't have my bottle here, but it says it's Liquitex Flow Aid. Facebook Liquitex. Liquitex, it's, uh, I don't know, how, how's, how do they spell it? You go to any art supply place, and the, they'll most likely carry Liquitex. Okay. Yeah, but it's called Flow. Okay. Hobby Lobby carries it. Uh, Blix will carry it. I've seen there's a Blix here. I was going to hit that before I actually come in here tonight. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm in Canada, so, like, you know, we don't get Blix. But anyway, yeah, it's Liquitex Flow Aid. Uh, ten, again, I've been throwing this price around ten bucks, but uh, it's ab about uh, it's smaller than this, and this is about uh, eight fluid ounces, so it's probably about four or three fluid ounces. But like, it's a big bottle, kind of like it looks a bit like this. Its label will kind of look a bit like that, right? But it'll be a slightly smaller bottle. It'll look like it'll slosh around like water, and uh, you only ever need a drop or two in your mixture, I definitely would recommend using medium to, to thin the color out. So for example, like if I was gonna take uh, this Temple Guard Blue and turn it into a shade wash, I'd put one drop down, maybe three or four drops of medium, and then one drop of Liquitex Floyd. And I usually have mine in a dropper style bottle, which of course I can't find. Oh, three. Yeah, and right in here is where I have my Liquitex Floyd. And again, like I said, I just, Simply grab it and you know put a drop into the into the color and I'm rocking and rolling and I can turn any color I want into a shade wash and you're no longer limited by egg rex or shade or you know null oil or carbon crimson. Maybe you want Mephiston Red to be a shade wash. Maybe you want you know Temple Guard Blue to be a shade wash, which is what I use because whenever I'm doing like um, bronze and I want to have that oxidization in the bronze. Sotec Green and Temple Guard Blue are my favorite ones to use. 
And then nilic oxide is another one, which is essentially just a bit lighter like this, but the same thing. It's just this color, lighter, and they have their manufacturing process to make it, you know, creep within recesses. But yeah, that's essentially it. Um, and of course, this stopped on me. You son of a, or he's still going. Or I don't think he's going. I think he's, I don't know what he's doing on me now. He's gone. The camera's gone, apparently. This camera's still rolling, but yeah. So. Is there something that you would recommend for somebody to start out with airbrush? Yes, definitely. Um, like, I don't, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Mini Wargaming's Vault. Uh, it's, uh, if, if you're familiar with Mini Wargaming, um, we have a, a paywall. You can try it out for seven days for free, but we get the silver membership because it gives you access to all the painting videos. So you can try it out for free, but you'll most likely will stay a vault member because it's really awesome. Um, there we have a series in there created by Austin, uh, Death Ray Designs. He's here selling for Death Ray Designs. It's, a, it's a MDF terrain, and he created this really fantastic series about seven years ago called Airbrush Everything, where he goes over the anatomy and he talks about like uh, various uh, effects. You know, like when you see. Uh, you know, when you're using too much PSI or too thin a paint, you'll see like the spider legs and, you know, he goes over all those things. So it's like really um, new person friendly. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's, it's a really fantastic series. It gets you right into airbrushing. It gives you, you know, really the, um, the nuts and bolts of getting into airbrushing. And yeah, uh, it, it helped me when I was getting into this about six years ago. And, you know... He's, uh, and of course, if you're ever online and you're looking for um, painting videos and stuff like that, I would look towards artists, not so much war gamers, but uh, illustration artists, artists who are working with this brush to its full usage. Because as war gamers, we don't use this tool to its full ability. Uh, we, we only use it for a couple of things. Whereas people who are painting, you know, uh, like, auto body and gas tanks or you know big canvases and stuff like that those guys those artists are using this like a proper brush war gamers we don't use this to its its proper uh abilities but yeah those are the guys that if any of those tips you can draw from those guys take it as gospel because it'll it'll be good information but yeah because most war gamers they don't know what they're talking about as far as like <laughs> Well, because they're not using it, the tool, to its full potential, right? I mean, you know, and I mean, like, I, I know enough of, because like I said, like, I went to school for art, and so, like, you know, I've dabbled in many different forms of art, and, you know, everything from photography, sculpture, textiles, painting, you know, <clears throat> that this is just like this, but we don't use this. I mean, we don't, we don't do this to do details like eyeballs or writing uh, um, script or anything like that, right? We don't use this for any of those things. And there's lots of brush strokes. There's one I, uh, I was fascinated by is uh, an airbrush artist, and it's a very common technique called a dagger stroke, that they call a dagger stroke, where basically the, you're, you're starting... Are just about done? Yeah, we're just about, yeah. In fact, yeah, I'm done. It's called a dagger stroke. Basically, the brush starts off uh, away from the canvas, and then you come in, and you're kind of like, uh, you're high pressure, and then no pressure as you follow through with the stroke. And basically what it does, it's, it's for um, uh, the airbrush artists who are doing like portraits and stuff, and they're doing eyelashes. We're not doing any of that kind of crap in this. Yeah, they're doing eyelashes using that particular brush stroke because it looks like an eyelash as they're doing it with this airbrush. We don't do that kind of crap. I'll do it with that seven the yeah, yeah, you know, so, you know, but I mean, again, like I said, it, it, but in Mini Warriors Vault, uh, airbrush everything, there, and a bunch of the videos that I've done in more recent years, uh, where we, we talk about airbrush and taking care of it and stuff like that, I've added on top of that, but Austin's series is really great, and it's well produced, it's really nice videos, and it's very clear instruction, and, you know, again, it's, it's something, I, and it's something we made eight years ago, I think, seven years ago. And it still holds up today, you know. And again, like a lot of the painting videos that I made, like, you know, five years ago and what have you, still hold up today because, again, the nature of painting really has not changed in hundreds of years. 
you know, using a brush to apply pigment to a surface has not changed in hundreds of years, not since like the res Renaissance. So, you know, only this thing is really a 21st century, or a 20th century device, right? Recommendations on the hairbrush? Recommendation, uh, Badger. Go visit Ken over at the corner, over there. Uh, you know, or visit badgerhairbrush.com. <laughs> <laughs> Without sounding too much like a shill. <laughs> say, it sounds like you're getting a kickback. <laughs> no, I don't. I, well, oh, yeah, I kind of do. I, I can't lie. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I like the boys in the office, uh, they use a Wadas, and they like them. Um, you know, uh, there's plenty of people out there who buy a Wada and appear to like them. There's lots of airbrushes out there. The only ones that people ever complain about are the China ones, the ones they're getting from China. Those are the only ones that everybody complains about. I mean, you know, Badger, it's American made. Awada is European, right? Buy American. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't get any more patriotic than that. I don't know. <laughs> well, don't they have one called Patriot too? Yeah, this is the Patriot. Yeah, this brush here is the Patriot. <laughs> the Patriot 105. It's my favorite brush. Um, I have, I have on this though, I have uh, the high roller trigger. This, uh, they have a brush called uh, the Patriot Extreme. It's got like a matte metal finish. It has an adjustable nozzle under here for controlling more air airflow, which as a beginner you might not care about, but uh, it's supposedly pretty, pretty handy. Uh, but I like this higher trigger on this. Now the Patriot Extreme has this higher trigger, but I had to buy this one separately for this brush. But because this brush normally the, the triggers that like down here and when you're working like this, especially for a you know long time, it's, you can kind of cramp up, especially if you got big hands and holding these little brushes. I mean, like, if you ever held like these things, you can come see. I mean, like, normally, um, yeah, I don't have any of the, the smaller triggers over here, but with these brushes, you know, the high roller, it's you sit with your hand up higher like that. Go ahead. And so when you're, when you're airbrushing, you're pushing down on that trigger and you're pulling that back. And that's uh, pushing down, starts the air, pull it back, uh, increases um, flow of paint. So okay. as little pressure as you're pulling back, you're not releasing a lot of paint. But the airflow, pretty much as soon as you start it, it's just one pressure. But you can, most compressors will have um, control valves and you can control the pr air pressure from the valve on the compressor. And so that's one way. So you're doing it both. Yeah, yeah, you're, it's a bit of a juggle, but once you get used to the concepts, you know, of, you know, controlling the airflow and how much paint you're releasing, you can pretty much get it down. And like with this brush, I'm doing priming, I'm doing base coating, and I'm doing some effects. Uh, with this size of needle, you'll find that there's different needle sizes for airbrushes. The finer, the smaller uh, measurement will be a fine detail brush for doing fine lines and, you know, more control, but usually you're turning the PSI down as you're getting in closer to the boards of work surface. Whereas this brush, it's priming, and priming I'm usually about this far away. And I'm just, yeah, I'm just priming. And I mean, with an airbrush and priming, that's this gets a lot of priming work. And when you have the airbrush, you can prime all year long. You know, if anybody's using rattle cans, what have you, you know, winter time is no good, hot summer days or really humid, you know, it could be a real tough time. Whereas if you have the airbrush and you have a little air booth uh, to draw out the uh, particulates, yeah, you can airbrush all year long and you know, get your work done. But yeah, if you're getting into airbrush, it it can be a bit pricey getting the airbrush, getting the compressor, but the paints, you can pretty much just use what you're currently using. Just gotta thin it down with a bit of water or medium. I recommend medium and you know, you'll be fine. Because well, water-based paints, like the, like you'll see some paints are uh, regular, like say Citadel, and then they have Citadel Air. Right. All it is is thinner, thinner paint. And you can use the medium for that. And you can use medium for that on that on that thicker paint. Like the Liquitex. Yeah. Medium or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use this one here, this Aztec. This is from Testers, and they have a uh, well, they're enamel-based paint line, but they also have uh, some water uh, acrylics. And yeah, this is from their acrylic line. And it works fine in the paints. Uh, water-based acrylics are pretty much water-based acrylics. 
but be sure to check that it is a water-based acrylic, you know. But again, with this brush, you can run lacquers, you can run water-based acrylics, you can run oil paint through it. As long as you clean it. As long as you clean it, take care of it, it'll always work for you, you know. And that's any brush. It doesn't matter what brand. You know, as long as you take care of it, it'll work. So, yeah. Anywho, guys, I want to thank you guys for stopping by and checking things out. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And, and, and posing your questions. Uh, hopefully you guys uh, found this enlightening and yeah um, again waythebrush.com and YouTube I do this uh, every Saturday so if you need you know have questions or what have you you can send me emails at chris at miniwargaming.com and pose your questions and even if you have pictures or whatever and say you want help with the color scheme what have you you can always post it and you know ask questions there but yeah so I don't do, do this at this kind of thing, I do this every week. Every week I'm answering people's questions. Great. Yeah? Was this helpful at all, at least? Indeed. Enlightening a little bit? Yeah. I'm sure. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I deal with your shit all the time. So never mind. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you guys for coming. And, uh, yeah. Now I'm going to clean up. And I'm going to stop this. Right? What's that? It's a bumper.